traffic. Is that how traffic? <laughs> so, 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 oh, I took the I-70? Yeah, that was like... Oh, so it was like... Yeah, I see, I guess. Did it work? Yeah, it was pretty much faster than second. You know, you go near I-70 and you see that... There's a parallel. On I-70, like, everybody's staying there. Really? But, you know, it's like, it's wrong. It's much harder than that. Alright, good, good. Oop, oop. Okay. <laughs> Everybody ready? Yes. Good. <laughs> okay. So I hope you had a really nice weekend. We had some uh, nice hikes. Some of you went uh, with me on Saturday and Sunday. And <laughs> at least I know some of you went to the um, sand dunes, right? And before you went to the sand dunes, you asked me if I can help you with returning the equipment. And I said, sure, as long as you answer one question <laughs> through the hike. And then Saturday night I got an email, you know, we don't need your help. And I <laughs> 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 so I was wondering if you still solve the question. So the question that I asked, okay, and I really hope you discussed it in the hike, was what is the mass of the B-Meson? That's the first part of the question. And how it is relating to hiking in Colorado, okay? <laughs> so we did discuss it. You did? Yeah. <laughs> Good. And, and the answer is? Uh, it's, uh, let's make sure I get this. 5,380 meters, which is like a mile. <laughs> I'm so happy. That was definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy, you know. <laughs> That the best one can hope as a professor, you know? <laughs> what else you can hope? That all you students go camping nicely and all they think about is what is the mass of the B-Mason? <laughs> <laughs> what else? So for those of you who didn't uh, got the, the thing, <coughs> let me tell you my little story. So when I was, <laughs> you know, I sound so old, uh, like half of my <laughs> lectures are stories. Anyway, but when I was your age and I was in Tassie in 1994, you heard it before, and we went hiking, and Tom took us hiking up there. And then it was the sign of elevation, one mile, five to 80 feet, OK? And as someone who do B physics, back then it was all my life was three years. <laughs> now all my life is whatever, 20 something. Immediately jump at you that the mass of the B meson is five to 80. And one thing that you have to remember, OK? And that's completely true. It's much simpler to remember two things than one thing, OK? So I don't know how many of you, how many of you here are not American, did not born in the US? Wow, I think more than half. OK. So for those of you like me, who never born in the US, and you never know what a feet is, and of course, the last thing you know is how many feet there is in one mile. OK? Because in all other normal systems, you know, it's some factors of 10 or 12. And then there's kind of this amazing, completely natural scales of feet. Feet is much more natural than a meter, right? Because feet is supposed to be like this, while a meter is completely arbitrary unit. So it's much more natural. And a mile is also much more natural than a kilometer. Why? I don't know, but supposedly, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how many, how many feet there is in one mile? How many of you, I assume all Americans know it, right? Because, yes? No? <laughs> More or less, you know, you know, like, you know, in 500 feet, turn left. So, you know, it's about like a quarter, you know, tenth of a mile, right? So, those of you who don't know how many feet there is in one mile, and it might be very useful one day. You never know when you will need it, right? And for those of you who doesn't know, or who do not know how ma what is the mass of the B-Meson, then come this amazing coincidence, okay? It's one of the most unexplained fine-tuning of nature. <laughs> <laughs> The mass of the B meson is within 10 to the minus 4 of the number of feet in a mile, <laughs> 5 to 80, OK? Good. <laughs> check it. Check your PDG. Open your PDG. And then you know, it's very, very nice to look for other, other such uh, coincidence, OK? And then I was seeking on lunch with someone else. And he said, oh, the mass of the tau. Who was this guy? Who was it? The mass of the tau. Yes, thank you. The mass of the tau is also the same as? 
declaration. And then we had a long discussion because what is the mass of the tau? What is the, what is the, declar the year of declaration? The independence? 1776. And what is the mass of the tau? 1777. So we are not so sure how precise. However, if you look for one extra decimal place, then the mass of the tau is 1776.8, right? While the, de the declaration was in July. Seven, seven. <laughs> okay, so actually we are getting close. So uh, <coughs> anyway, so you know, keep looking, and if you have more of those, let me know. Okay, I love them, so I can remember. And if not, just memorize the PDG. You know, it's uh, <laughs> okay. So <coughs> what we did last time? Let me come back to physics. So what we did last time? We <coughs> I made the big deal about the fact that the standard model that in nature. Flavor is not generic, okay? So last time, last time, we said the following things. Flavor in nature, flavor is far from the, is not generic, is far from generic, right? Generic. And what we mean by this, that we say, and how the standard model explain it. So instead of saying what is happening in nature, let me give you already the standard model explanation. In the standard, and the standard model explains nature. So the standard model, there's only the charge Ws, the W plus minus, is the only one, the only source of flavor breaking. Of flavor breaking. It's only come from the W <coughs> plus minus. And that, we emphasize this has to do with any standard model. And then with our standard model, and additional to the fact that it's only come by the W plus minus, there's also the fact that there's many, many, many small parameters. There's many small parameters. Many small numbers. Many small numbers. So this fact, the fact that it's only the W that make flavor change in a track, and the fact that we have many small numbers, this combination make the flavor sector very far from generic. Okay? And I didn't emphasize it last time, but I want to we kind of touch it. That's really in contradiction to the gauge sector. If you look at the gauge sector, the gauge sector is kind of generic. Okay? Just say, well, okay, I have this kind of thing. The, the loop correction are of order 1 over 16 pi squared, as they should. Everything is what you kind of expect from whatever. In flavor, it's a different story. Okay, so what I want to do today, I want to keep getting a little bit deeper into the question of why the standard model is uh, <coughs> not generic and how the standard model takes care of these kind of things. And then uh, I want to start, hopefully, to get into the how we do beyond the standard model. Oops, but that's probably the wrong one. Yes, OK, so I will. OK, that's OK. We don't really need it. That was last time. <laughs> OK. <coughs> so. <coughs> One thing I want to do before I, uh, <coughs> I want to do first is I want to discuss a little bit about the global symmetry of the standard model and how it is related to flavor. So we know that global symmetries are accidental symmetries, are not something that we impose. They are something that are an output of model building, right? The way we do model building, we impose only local symmetries. And then if we have an output, the output is a global symmetry. And it's there only because we keep renormalizing add non-renormalizable terms, these accidental symmetry are not there. And in the quark sector of the standard model, what is the accidental symmetry? What is the global symmetry of the standard model, of the quark sector of the standard model? The full standard model. You, no, that's when you don't put any Yukawas. At the very end of the day, in the full standard model, what survive? Just by your number, right? So we have the full standard, the full Quark sector of the standard model have only U1 baryon as an accidental symmetry, as a global accidental symmetry. And now what we like to ask is what's really how we got into this. And <coughs> if we treat the Yukawa coupling as a small parameters, you can say, oh, we start with some very large symmetry, some, something like U3 cubed for each of the fields. But <coughs> if I only consider the strong and the electromagnetic interaction, each flavor has its own U1 symmetry, right? 
So if I, have, if I turn off the weak interaction, and we think about the weak interaction somehow as a small parameter, if I only have QED and QCD, so under QED and QCD, the global symmetry is U1 to the 6. That is, each quark flavor <coughs> has its own U1. That is, in under U1, say, U1 charm, only the charm is charged and all the rest are not charged. So we know that QED and QCD cannot let any of those things, <coughs> any flavor violation. It's only the weak interaction that have it. And <coughs> now we ask how the Yukawa coupling break this U1 to the 6. Okay? And if I put only one Yukawa into the game, let's say I put only Y down. Let's say there was no Y up. How Y down would break this U1 to the 6? If I have only Y, y down, what happened to the U1 to the 6? U1, U1 to the 3. U1, because what's happened when I have Y down is just like what we have in the lepton sector, right? That is, we only have masses for the down component, which is just what we have in the lepton sector, which is we only have masses for the charged lepton. And then Y down, break U16 to U1 cube. That is, each pair of U1s become one U1, right? So U1S and U, U1, U and U1D become U1 of the first generation. U1S and U1C become U1 of the second generation, and U1T and U1B become U1 of the third generation, just like we have in the lepton, okay? And clearly, if we have only U1 up, only the Yukawa of the up, it will be the same. However, if we have both, then it breaks down, okay? So if we have this, but if we have Y up, and y down, it break down to u1 by your number. <coughs> so this is, again, a very general, fe general feature of all standard model. It's not our standard model. In our standard model, what's happened that these symmetries become somewhat approximate. Why they become somewhat approximate? Because we can think about y down and part of y up as small numbers, right? The top is large, so we cannot think about the top as, la as, as a small number. But the bottom is still kind of small, because what is the Yukawa of the bottom is of order 10 to the minus 2. So we can definitely think about all y down as small. So then we can think about the u1 <coughs> cubed, in some cases, as an approximate symmetry. Okay? So that's become important later. I just wanted to, to mention it here before we go on. OK, so now I want to discuss flavor change in neutral current and why they are so important and how the standard model take care. So now I can do this and then I can move it up afterwards. Okay. So how much of this is true because, because the powers are different? So the, yes, so clearly if, if we had degeneracy, the situation would be much more complicated, right? So let's say that, the, um, that we had a degeneracy between one sector, then we'll have a U2 symmetry rather than a U1 cube. Right? So if the three masses were the same, we'll have a U3. If we have two degeneracy, we have U2 cross, cross U1. And since all three are non-degenerate, we have U1 cubed. And it's really good to understand those because to some degree we say they're almost degenerate because the mass of the D and the S, both are very, very small compared to the weak scale or compared to lambda QCD, and therefore we get this kind of uh, symmetry. Okay, but I really just wanted to touch upon it and I want to move to flavor change in neutral current. So in the standard model, we say there's no flavor change in neutral current at three level, and that's a very big deal. Because there's no flavor change in neutral current at three level, flavor change in neutral current is suppressed, and most of flavor changing happens through charge interactions through the W. So <coughs> I want to discuss how the neutral current that we have, what kind of mechanism the neutral current kind of developed in order to make it flavor diagonal. Okay? And it's really important to understand those because basically we use those tricks that we use for the standard model when we go and we do model building for BSM. So let me start with the following questions. What bosons, of course we only need bosons because only bosons can generate uh, currents and, and forces. What neutral bosons we have in the standard model? And all of them, all the coupling of all of those bosons are diagonal in flavor space. So let me ask you the first question. What are the neutral bosons of the standard model? Photon, Z, Higgs, gluons. Very good. So there's kind of four of them 
Okay, the, the gluon have eight degrees of freedom, but there's four kinds of them, okay? And we know that all, the coupling of all four gauge bosons in flavor space are diagonal, okay? They are not, may not be universal, but they are diagonal. Universal, this, it means that they are the same, right? Is the photon coupled the same to all flavor? Not really, it's coupled to up and down differently. Is the Higgs coupled the same for whole flavor? No. Is the Z coupled the same? Also, no. The gluon actually, yes, for all the quarks. But <coughs> the question is why all of those are coupled in a diagonal way, and that's what I like to explain. Like, what really is the important ingredient of the standard model that made it? Okay? So let me start actually with the photon on the gluon, because the photon and the gluon actually has the same mechanism that guarantee that the photon and the gluon have no flavor change in neutral current. So what is the mechanism that guarantee that the photon and the gluon must couple diagonally to quarks? Sorry? Speak up, I don't hear you. Not really. What makes sure that the photon and the gluon couple diagonally? Gauge invariant. Okay? It is gauge invariant. As long as the symmetry is unbroken, it's guaranteed that it's coupled diagonally. And if you like to ask how do you know it, the answer is when you have the photon and the gluon, uh, any gauge symmetry that is unbroken, the coupling comes only through the kinetic term, right? So when we work in with canonical kinetic term, that is if we, ga if we diagonalize the kinetic term, automatically we diagonal the gauge interaction. Okay? So that's actually a very strong result. As long as your gauge symmetry is exact, your gauge coupling guaranteed to couple diagonally. So if someone asks you to take any model and you do whatever calculation in the model, and you end up that you have an exact gauge symmetry that's coupled non-diagonally, you know that that's a mistake. Okay? And I had students come to me and said, oh, look, I did the calculation. And what I say, you know, I know you made a mistake. I don't want to go all over all your calculation, I just know that you made a mistake if the the, it's the gauge symmetry that guarantees it, okay? So this is quite good, but actually it's not very useful for beyond the standard model physics because when you do beyond the standard model, all the gauge symmetry that we add eventually are broken, right? We don't add any exact gauge symmetry. But that's actually kind of under nice to understand for the standard model. So now let's move to the second one. And the second one I want to explain why the Higgs coupling is diagonal in, in flavor space, okay? And let's see, can you, like why the Higgs coupling is diagonal in flavor? What really make it diagonal in flavor space? The Yukawa coupling is completely arbitrary, right? So you have some arbitrary Yukawa coupling, and what's really happened such that at the end of the day the Higgs coupled diagonally, right? The Higgs coupled only to B, 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 I. There's no coupling of the Higgs to B, B, B and S, right? It's aligned with the mass matrix. That's really the point. And the mechanism, which is called alignment, okay? Because we have this alignment. A alignment. And that's a very, very <coughs> nice trick, and we use it later on when we do model building. The idea is as following. You have completely arbitrary matrix. However, for some reason, the same matrix that diagonalize this arbitrary matrix is also the same matrix that diagonalize the mass matrix, okay? So when we move to the mass basis, we also diagonalize these things. For the Higgs, it's rather trivial, right? All you need to know is that you say, oh, let's write the Yukawa interaction. So the Yukawa interaction is something like this, right? Something like, say, <coughs> uh, UI left UJ, right? And the mass may basis is defined when this y up is diagonal. And clearly when y up is diagonal, also the coupling of the Higgs is diagonal. So this alignment is kind of very trivial, right? Obviously when we diagonalize, because it's the same U, it's the same matrix, so when we diagonalize it, we're also diagonalizing the mass of the Higgs. Okay? So we see here actually that the standard model Many times we hear why in the standard model there's only one Higgs doublet. And the answer is, well, it's the minimal choice. And when we do model building, we usually want to do minimal choices, right? Why, why to add two Higgs when one would do the, the job? 
However, what happens if we have two Higgses? If we have two Higgses, do we have a Higgs flavor changing interaction? Yes. Generically, yeah. Generically, yes. Right? I really hope that you see it. Because what's happened when we have two Higgses? When we have two Higgses, what's happened is that we have something like this. Y up 1, H1 plus Y up 2, H2 times whatever U by U. And what give mass? What give mass to the quarks? What give mass is the diagonalization of both y1, a1, 2 with the corrected with you know v1 and v2. However, what give you the coupling of the physical Higgs is this one, this h1 couple only, like y1 and h2 couple. And h1 and h2 may not be the mass eigenstate of the Higgs, so there's some other rotation, etc. But in general, those rotations are not the same rotation, and what diagonalize everything. Okay? So in the standard model, the reason that the Higgs couple diagonally is really only because there's only one Higgs in the standard model. More than one Higgs is we already have a problem. And that's already we start, you, you start feeling like how complicated it is when we go beyond the standard model, why Higgs produce such, so much of a problem, because it's a very delicate system. When you have one, it's okay, but when you have already two Higgs, you start having problems. Okay? And I guess all of you know that in supersymmetry there's two Higgs, right? So how Susie deal with it? So we just explained that two Higgs is we have a big problem. Because I don't know if it's a big problem. We have a problem because the Higgs in general couple non-diagonally to flavor. Yes. That's right. So in supersymmetry, we say, aye, we, have, we do have two Higgs. However, each Higgs still satisfy this. For the down type, there's only one Higgs. And for the up type, there's only down, one type. And in supersymmetry, we solve it by <coughs> Olomorphy and things like this. Uh, so we always have tricks, some model building tricks, when we want to put two Higgs tablets to kind of make sure that we have alignment. Okay? So in SUSY, we keep the same alignment in order to have the Higgs couple diagonally. Okay? Good. <coughs> so we got the Higgs. We understand how the Higgs is doing it. And now what's happening with the Z? Or the last one. How does Z make sure that it's coupled diagonally. Equivalence Sorry? Equivalence the equivalence theorem, I don't really think it's related to the equivalence theorem, actually. So <coughs> the equivalence theorem just you know, tell you about the longitudinal part of the Z. But I'm really thinking about the transverse part. What's really make, what property of the standard model make it such that the Z couple diagonally? Okay. Yes? No, so the gauge invariant is broken. And actually, the gauge invariant, what the gauge invariant guarantee is that the A, the, you know, the W3 and the A and the B couple diagonally. But after we rotate them, we don't know what's happened because it's become massive. So actually, I can write, and I really hope that all of you, you should actually do it. You can write a very nice model where the Z couple in a non-diagonal way. It's very easy to do, actually. So it's really guaranteed. I, 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 mm? No, it's not. It's nothing to do. The custodial symmetry has to do with the Higgs sector, and actually, it's nothing to do with the fact that the Z couple diagonally. So, what is really happened that makes sure that the Higgs couple diagonally? Mm? So, the G mechanism is actually very important. And the G mechanism, if you like, is very directly part of the unitarity of the CKM. And it's actually very much related to the question why the Z is not coupled, coupled diagonally. And actually, what, what happened, and it's a really cool thing, is then when, when the, if the Z were not coupled diagonally, then we have violation of the G mechanism. I will talk about the G in, in, you know, in, in, in 10 minutes. But in model building, can you think about what's really in the standard model and make it really clear? Yes. Yes, very, very good. Yes, yes. Let me explain it one more, my, the way I explain it, but it's basically what you say. You're absolutely correct. So what, at the end of the day, what guaranteed that the Z coupled diagonally is the following very interesting situation. So we all know that in the standard model, we know that electric charge Q is equal to T3 plus Y. And what things can mix? 
When we do a rotation, a basis rotation, clearly we can only rotate things that have the same quantum number under the unbroken symmetry. I cannot mix a charge 1 and a charge 0 fermion. I can only mix all the charge 1 or all the charge third, right? And I cannot mix a colo triplet with a colo singlet. I can only mix state that have the same quantum number under the unbroken symmetry, right? So in particular, when I talk about the fermions, I can only mix things that have the same electric charge. Clearly? Yes. However, in principle, they don't have to have the same T3 and Y. All they have to do is that they have the same sum. The T3 plus Y of all the things that can mix have to be the same. In principle, I could mix things that have different T3 and different Y, but they can still mix as long as the Q is the same. However, what's happening in the standard model? In the standard model, all the quarks that have, say, charge two-third, not only that they have the same charge, they also have the same T3 and the same Y, right? Because the three generations are identical, I can actually, <coughs> I, I get this interesting situation that all the charges, all the fermions with the same charge happen to have also the same T3 and the same Y. And because of this property, the Z coupling is diagonal. Okay? And I'm not going to prove it to you. I, <coughs> I have a little, really cute homework, and I really hope you can do it. Just add what we call vector light quarks to the standard model and just see that it, <coughs> it works differently. Let's say that I have a, a, what we call a non sequential fourth generation. Okay? Instead of having a regular fourth generation, I have another one that I call it T prime L which is a three one and a third and t sorry and a two third and t prime right which is three one and two third okay so this is a vector like generation i can write a mass term for this the, for the two of them okay and in particular <coughs> they okay, this guy tr couple like the rest of the u of the uptype quarks and what's happened this one still have an electric charge of two third Let's look at this one. What is the electric charge of this TL? The electric charge of this TL is two third, right? But the C3 of it is zero and the Y is two third. So I have a charge Q third. The rest of the uptype left-handed quarks, T3 is half and Y is, a, is one over six. That give me the two third. So this one, this TL prime, have the same Q, but a different T3 and a different Y than the rest of the left-handed uptype quarks, okay? You just add it to the just add it to the standard model, add these two terms to the standard model, write the most general mass matrix, okay? Diagonalize it, work out the coupling of the Z, and what you find out is that the Z coupling is not diagonal, okay? And if you like, I have it right, you know, with nice item, 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 with answers and everything, because I gave it, I think, to all the students in all my classes. It's a really cool one, you know, it shouldn't take you more than half an hour, okay? <coughs> but that's the important point. The important point is that we have this thing, okay? So, yes? Before uh, electric symmetry breaking, we have u and y, right? Yes. And part of it goes to z and part of it goes to delta. That's right. And doesn't that imply that they both should have the same kind of coupling? So the, 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 the coupling of the, <coughs> of the y has the same coupling, and what we're saying is completely correct. Before electroweak symmetry, TL prime cannot mix with T prime, with T, right? Because before electroweak symmetry breaking, that's what we have, right? So these two fields cannot mix before electroweak symmetry breaking. After electroweak symmetry breaking, because the Higgs acquires a wave, the up component of Q left can mix with the T prime L, right? So what you are saying is completely correct, that before electroweak, the U1Y, the whatever, the B field, the B field couple only to this, and only to this, and there's no mixing. The B field cannot really mix them. But the physical Z can mix them. Sure. Okay? I was wondering if that implies that we cannot calculate U and S because the gamma and the gamma Oh, okay. So, so at the end of the day, what we call a U and a C is a standard model U and C, right? Now, if you add these kind of fields to the standard model, then what you would call a U would also should have, in general, some T prime component. So the U that you have, it's not our U, right? And this U and that C, because then you have a U and a C that both of them have some T prime component, then they can have flavor change in neutral current, okay? So, yeah, if you have some time, really, try to do this. Just 
add those two fields to the sample and do what you did in the past and just follow the, you know, the, the standard diagonalization procedure and see where, where you end up. Okay? So when we talk about the Z-coupling, the word that we use to describe why the Z have no flavor change in other kind, we use the word of universality. Okay? We say the reason that the, it doesn't have flavor change in other kind is because the coupling of the thing under it are universal. Okay? So let me write this word. That's universality. Universality. And it's important because when we go to do beyond the standard model, again, we're exactly going to use this property of universality, just like the standard model is, is uh, using here. Okay? Good. So you kind of see, you know, if you like, the way to go is just, you know, the standard model, just write it down and keep doing the pro But then we see that the reason, there's kind of some of deep reason. The standard model have no flavor change in neutral kind because it's only one Higgs coupling and because the three generation are what we call a sequential three generations. They are exactly the same. And if we put what we call a non-sequential fourth generation, if we put some other quarks that have different quantum number, we will have flavor change in neutral kind. Good. <coughs> so we understand why there's no flavor change in neutral kind in the standard model at three level. But of course, we should have that at one loop. Yes? Of course? Everybody agree? Yes? OK. Why of course? Because we know that flavor is broken by charge current interaction at three level. And therefore, at some loop, we must have it also at anything, you know, <coughs> it will be generated. And <coughs> the question is what's happening at flavor changing neutral current at one loop. So I want to discuss FCNC at one loop. And what we're going to find out is as following. Naively, when you say things are one loop, what immediately jump at you? What is the suppression factor? When I tell you, oh, something is one loop, you should say, therefore, it's suppressed by? Uh, that's everybody know, huh? <laughs> that I don't have any problem of, you know, like giving you hints, waiting. Right? 1 over 16 pi squared immediately, it's one loop diagram, right? So you would say, OK, FC and C, that's for you know it's 1 over 16 pi squared, also known as 1 over 100, OK? So it's about 10 to the minus 2, right? So you would just look at flavor change your kind and say they should be suppressed by about uh, 10 to the minus 2, and that's it. And you just go to the data and you find that the data, the flavor change in neutral current in some cases, are suppressed by much, much more than this factor of 1 over 16 pi squared. Okay? And what I want to explain now is why, actually, in the standard model, this suppression is much bigger. And 1 over 16 pi squared, this suppression is, is suppression in any standard model. It's not related to the parameter of our standard model. And the other factors are much re are related to our standard model, to those small parameters. Okay? And let's go under the famous gene mechanism that I'm sure all of you heard about it. Maybe even if you don't fully remember, you for sure heard about the gene mechanism. So let me try to explain the gene mechanism again, kind of where, where it's coming from. And so the prime example of the gene mechanism is let's look at the process of KK bar mixing. So we look at the amplitude that takes a kaon into an anti kaon. And this is a flavor change in neutral current because. It's the same charge. And we start with, um, say, a kaon, S d bar, S bar d. That's a kaon. I don't know why, but this is the convention. The kaon have the S bar. The heavier quark is the bar when we have the kaon. And then eventually, we want to make it into a k bar. Okay. And let me plot what is called the box diagram. Why it's called a box diagram? It looks like a box hmm? with arms, yeah. Like the penguin looks like penguin with arms and whatever. <laughs> Physics is abstract. Our art is abstract, <laughs> right? Never try to explain why it's penguin. It looks like a penguin. It's abstract. OK, so that's the box diagram. The bar should be here. <laughs> Good. I just want to make sure you are not sleeping. <laughs> <coughs> 
And so, you know, this dagger, actually, there's two of them. You can also replace, you know, the, the, the quas curve like this. But that's the leading order diagram that give me k to k bar. And you just go in and you calculate the, this diagram. And what you do, you just said, okay, what's really going here? This, this wavy line are two w's, two w's. Okay? And what go on here in the upper ones, they are like uptight quarks. Which uptight quarks? Of course, the very first thing you learn in quantum mechanics is you write all the amplitude, you first add them and then square, you remember? Very good. <laughs> I know. So you have to put all the uptight quarks here, right? So let's put here U, C, and T. And let's put here U, C, and T. Okay? And you add all those diagrams and that gives you the amplitude. It's important that what we care about is, is the amplitude. It's not the branching ratio. You don't take the amplitude and square it. Okay? I will, hopefully, we'll have time in my last lecture to actually get into more details into this. So we do this, and what we find out? We find out that we have here four CKM elements, right? In each of these vertex, we have a CKM element. And when you write it down, you find that the amplitude, therefore, is proportional to the sum over V i s V i d star. That's come from the up type of sum of i from the upper one, and then from the lower one we call VIS, v, sorry, VJS, VJ, D star. So we have also <coughs> sum of uh, J, because we have one here and one here, times some function that must be proportional to the masses of what's running in the loop, MI, MAJ. Okay, so all this is under the sum. Yes? So of course, one, one really nice thing to do is actually to calculate it. And the way to calculate it is uh, you use Feynman diagram, rule, you know why, you write the propagator, k slash plus m, ta ta ta, and you do it, and it's, it's really cool, and you calculate what f is. But I don't want to do this. I want to try to argue that we can get some properties of f without actually calculating. We cannot really get it all, but we can get some properties of f without ever calculating it. Okay? So the first thing that we have to note, <coughs> we have to use the fact that the CKM is unitary. And since the CKM is unitary, what we can say about the case where f would be a constant, if f was independent on the masses. So I'm asking if f, if f is a constant, if f of m i m j equals just a constant, what I get for a? Hmm? a is equal to? to zero. Why if f is a constant a is zero? Because if f is a constant, I can put the f outside the sum. And then this sum is zero times zero, actually. It's, it's zero squared. Not that it will care much. <laughs> Once you have one zero, you know, you go home, right? You don't. But do you see why it's zero? It's zero because of the unitarity of the CKM. The unitarity of the CKM tells me that the product of two rows, a row times a row conju conjugate is zero. That's a property of unitary matrices, right? So if we take this f out of the, then we get it to be 0. Yes? So what we know about f, again, without doing any calculation, just what we know about calculating Feynman diagrams. So we know <coughs> that if it's a constant, that means that in the limit that the, all the masses are the same, then it's, it's 0, right? So therefore, it must be somehow sensitive to the difference between the two masses. Right? And it should be sensitive to the difference in the two masses, such that when the difference goes to zero, the amplitude goes to zero. So this, the difference between the two masses cannot be in the denominator. Right? It can only be in the numerator. Yes? So just based on this argument, I know that if I take these masses to be small, OK, that's, I, I, let me say. Now I make an extra assumption. I said, what is roughly, what is in the denominator? I know that we have the mass of the W. Right? So <coughs> let's forget about the top for the minute. And it's, let my, ah, I should have start like this. I want to forget about the top just because I know that numerically, the CKM coupling to the top is very, very small. So I can, let's assume that I forget about the top. And all I have is U and, U and, C, U and C. So I only consider U and C quarks. And the mass of the U and the mass of the C are much, much smaller than the mass of the W. So then I said, OK, I know that I can 
expand in those small parameters. Okay? And just based on the fact that I know that when the mass of the U and the C are equal, I must get zero, I know that it must be some function that is polynomial in the mass of the charm. Yes, because I make the expansion. So far, I didn't do any calculation. It's just based on this. So based on this, I know that f, say f of m i m j, have to go like some, the mass of the quarks to some power. OK? And this power could be 1, 2, 3, and 4, etc. And it's turned out that this number is 2. OK? So when you do the calculation, you find out that to leading order f goes like mc squared minus mu squared over mw squared in that dimensionless sense. OK? So I hope that you are see what <coughs> how I got this. So I was unable to explain why it's mc squared, but I was able to explain to you why, in the limit that mc equal to mu, this function must vanish. OK? It must vanish because of this unitarity of the CKM. OK? And it's turned out that it's mc squared. This goes under the name of the gene mechanism. Why it goes under the name of the gene mechanism? Because there are three people who are the um, initial. But what they did is the following. In 1970, the charm was not discovered yet, and the only U, D, and S were known. And then people didn't understand why diagram like KK bar mixing is so small. And they said, ah, if we have a charm, then we get this much higher suppression that go like MC squared over MW squared. Okay? So they assume there's the charm exists, and therefore they get this kind of uh, thing. Now, you know, in retrospect, the way we call the gene mechanism said, oh, gene mechanism is direct uh, consequences of CKM unitarity. Because the CKM is unitary, this function must be proportional to the mass of the internal quark to some, to, the, to some power, and therefore we have this extra MC of NW suppression. OK? Yes? Any questions? No? You should ask, because then I'll ask you a question if you don't ask. <laughs> no? Yes? Oh, because when they are diagonal, when they are, when they are, oh, actually, actually, yes, actually, actually, I have it here, OK? <laughs> you know, I have my, my usual joke is that I said, oh, anyway, I can show you, but you won't understand because it's in Hebrew, but I cannot run it on you. <laughs> 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 OK, so let me say it. Lama chayavim pitzul b'masot, which translates, why do we need non-degenerate masses? So I have it here, OK? And I'll, I'll show you. OK, so that's actually the question. And here it's with the question mark, mean I should ask it the, the students, OK? <laughs> so why should we have non-degenerate masses? What happens if the masses were degenerate? OK? Then that's the case of the F is a constant. Right, because we don't really care about the masses, as long as the masses are the same, then we can take this and put it out of the sum, and we get zero. Right? So as long what we care about is the non-degenerate of the masses. Okay? Because then we can actually take this f and put it outside the sum. Because the masses are different, then the sum, each term on the sum is different. When the masses are the same, we can take it out, and we get the zero from the, from the CKM unitarity. That's right. So what I'm saying is that I, so this one, you can write as mc plus mu times mc minus mu, right? So I, I, what I'm saying is that I don't know the exact form of f from this argument. All I know from this exact form of f is that you must have some form of some power of non-degeneracy. Okay? So it's, it's happened to be this. And that I cannot explain based on hand wave argument. For this, you, you know, eventually you have to do calculation, I mean. Sorry? Yeah, you could have log, OK? And actually, in this case, you don't have a log. But if you look for things like B2S gamma, you get logs, OK? So you could have logs instead of, uh, of powers. It's completely right. And it's go under the name of hard gym and soft gym, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's much more to the story, OK? All I want to say is that if the masses are the same, when you have the general masses, we, we don't have it. So it might be proportional to somehow, and it's end up to be MC squared in this case. For this, we don't have hand wave arguments. You have to do the calculation. OK? Good. So let me ask you one more question. <coughs> so what we find here, so we can forget about the mass of the U. Let's forget about the mass of the U. We find that the KK bar mixing, this, this amplitude, 
end up to be proportional to 1 over 16 pi squared time mc squared over mw squared that's additional suppression time all the ckm that we have right so we have other ckm which end up to be something like <coughs> vus vud absolute value squared this is one but this is sino sinus theta cabibo so we see that we have this really extra suppression this one is suppression in that we get from one loop in any standard model and these two are specific to this standard model that we have in yes shouldn't it be vcs like isn't the secant the dominant one Oh, so actually it's both that are the same. So in a two generation, in two generation, VCS, VCD is the same as VUS, VUD, yeah, yeah. right? But you're right. We should do it. Actually, what really enter here should be something that's completely basis independent. We can actually write it. We can discuss it much more, like anything, okay? But the point is that at the end of the day, we see this extra suppression. Good? But I was... I learn it as advertised. Haha, <laughs> we get this extra suppression, right? Everybody happy with this? Good. I also kind of happy. <laughs> it's good. It's good to be happy. But I want to ask you a question, okay? Have you heard about the decoupling theorem? Everybody heard about the decoupling theorem? The decoupling theorem states the following obvious statement. It said if you have some physics that it's at extremely short distance, you shouldn't care about it, right? We shouldn't care about what's happening at the Planck scale when we do, you know, particle physics. And in particular, when you do condensed matter physics, you shouldn't care about what your friends at high energy physics are doing. Sometimes they indeed don't care, <laughs> which is a problem, right? <laughs> but I mean, because this we call scale separation. It's very, very important in, the, in, in physics. When we do something, we don't care about higher order. That is, every new, f if you have some new particle, the effect of the new particle must come in the denominator. And here we have KK bar mixing, and we find this really cool result that when I take the mass of the charm higher, I get a larger effect. And that's very counterintuitive. Just think about this, this loop diagram. When I have things that run in the loop that are heavier, we expect the result to be more suppressed. It violates the decoupling theorem. Yes. Oh, so what's happened, let's say, if we have the, <coughs> if I take the mass of the, yeah, 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 well, what you're saying is the right answer. I <laughs> it's related to this, okay? So let me say it my word. What you are saying is correctly the right answer, okay? I just, again, I want to say it my word. So what he's saying, oh, we have the mass of the W. You cannot make, make, play this trick on me. I said, oh, let's take this one up and just, uh, you have this one. You cannot, like, think as this one is not there, okay? Actually, I, I could not write it because it's in the prop. That's uh, this prop. I could put it in the prop, right? Because it's proportional, too. So I could put the NW in the proportional, too, and then, you know, you would, not, you would notice. But you would know, know it anyway because you know it must be one of NW squared. So the answer is that this doesn't violate the decoupling theorem because what's really happened is that this whole story has to do because of electroweak symmetry breaking, okay? And what's really, at the end of the day, you can think about what's happened is that it is the Yukawa coupling that plays a role here. And when you take the mass of the charm to be heavier, what you really do is you take the Yukawa coupling of the charm to be heavier. And that's not a violation of the, of the decoupling theorem. The decoupling theorem tells you if you just take a mass of a particle to be heavier. But of course, if at the same time you also take the coupling to be bigger, you don't decouple. The decoupling is if you just take the mass and doesn't change anything else. Here, this is not the case. Changing the mass of the quarks always also change the, the Yukawa coupling. And the Yukawa coupling is a coupling, and therefore you don't have decoupling. Okay? So that's an important thing about playing with decoupling when we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. You have to remember this. Uh, this C alone got extra contribution from a heavier Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you, you know, you can play those games and you say, let's, let's assume, you know, go beyond the standard model and leave extra Higgs's, extra stuff, and then you will have more diagrams. Right? What I'm... Hmm? Yes. 
Exactly, exactly. So, so what would happen? So that's a very good question. Let's say that the charm gets its mass not only through the Higgs mechanism, but there's also bare mass term for the charm. I had a, a C left that is a singlet under SU2, and therefore I can write a C left, C right term, and I could write it here. What would happen if I have a, a, non a, a mass of the charm that comes not from the Higgs mechanism? How we solve this paradox? That's, I, is that the question? Yes. So I have a model. In this model, instead of having the charm get the mass the usual way, the charm get the mass by having a bare mass term. Let's go like C L C right. Both of them are singlet of S U two left. The C K M is look different. The C K M is not even unitary. You don't. You have flavor change in neutral kinds through Z exchange. Okay. So it's a whole different story. Okay. And actually, it's the Really, really nice what's happening is the three level versus the one loop and how they interplay with each other. So it's just this story that I was telling you is just not valid in this case. And actually, you, you look at it and you find that the mass of the charm completely decoupled. So you can take the mass of the, of the charm to infinity. And what's happened here is not the mass of the charm. What would happen here is something like the mass of the charm times some mixing angle. And when you take the mass of the charm to, to infinity, the mixing angle also goes to zero. Okay? So at the end, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all working. Yes. So you could think about it. So of course, this it depends on what gauge you decide to do this. So if you do it in some unphysical gauges, gauge, you actually see that you get these uh, things coming from the coupling of the whatever of the ghosts. Okay. Um, I love physical gauges most of the time. And the way I like to say it is just this, that in the theory as a whole, when you take the mass of the charm to infinity, you also at the same time increase Yukawa coupling, and therefore the coupling should not work. But it's completely correct what, another way to look at it, and, and for some people it might be much nicer to see it, is to look for some unphysical gauge where you have the, the ghost and you see that the ghost coupling like the Yukawa, and it's the, the longitudinal component of the W that actually gives you the effect. And you think about them as the Higgs. Okay. Any more question on this? Yes. About? Ah, what about the top quark? That's so good. Because I told you I make the assumption that I don't care about the top quarks. And always when you make an assumption in the beginning of the calculation, what you have to do at the end of the calculation, to check if your assumption is actually correct or not, right? So you look into this calculation and you plug it in and you find that the effect of the top is about 1% or 5% compared to that of the charm, okay? And the reason is that the Yukawa cap, that the mass of the top, you say, ah, the mass of the top is about 100 more than the charm, so you have mt squared is about 10 to the 4 larger than mc squared, but in terms of the, of the CKM, it's much smaller. Shall we do it? No, we should not do it. Let's do it. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the. Uh, that, uh, I thought you were asking something else. Yeah, you cannot make this assumption anymore. And then you have a function like you know this really nice function that go like one minus eight x squared plus six x to the four log. You know, you love those functions, right? Yeah. So you have those functions that. Yeah. So actually, you you do the calculation and what you find that this function, and it's about if you just make this ap this approximation, the fact that m top is twice m w. And you just, if you instead of writing mt squared over mw squared, you write the full function, it's an error of order three. Okay? Not so big. But of course, you know, you know how to calculate those functions. Okay? Actually, it's called Inami Lim functions because Inami and Lim were the first people who actually calculate because until sometimes in the 70s, or I don't remember when the paper came out, everybody made this assumption that are much smaller than MW, and nobody ever believed that the top can be heavier than MW, so nobody cares about And then they make this bold assumption that the top can be heavier than the W, and write a paper with just calculating all those functions, and everybody knows them as the Inami Lim function, and you go and you find those functions somewhere, you know, just, it's, it's basically some loop integrals with some, you know, Okay, so that's basically all I want to say about flavor change in neutral current. <coughs> and the bottom line about flavor change in neutral current is as following, okay? It's probably the big deal about flavor is the fact that we don't see flavor change in neutral current. And the reason is the following. The standard mode is built such that there's no flavor change in neutral current at three level. And on top of it, 
at one loop, we have this really G, the G mechanism that give us this extra suppression factor. It's a small CKM and in some cases some small mass ratios. Okay? So flavial chain neutrokines are highly suppressed in the standard model and that's what we see in nature and that's why it's such a big deal when we go and move and discuss things beyond the standard model. Okay. Everybody appreciates flavor change in neutral current? Yes? Good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, yeah. So if the two quarks are degenerate, then there's no, then, then this amplitude is completely vanishes, right? So the, if MU is zero by itself, it doesn't make any difference. What is important is if MC and MU are degenerate, in particular if both are zero, then we'll, we don't have flavor change in neutral current. In order to have flavor change in neutral current at one loop, we need that the masses are non-degenerate. Actually, l l l let's explore this point a little more. Do you see from a symmetry point of view why if the three, if let's say all quarks were degenerate, we will not have flavor chain neutral current. You, we will recover the U1 cube, right? Yes? So if you like, flavor chain neutral current must be proportional to the breaking of the U1 cube that I was kind of uh, starting the lecture with. Is it clear? Right? Because if the ma it's just what happened in the um, lepton sector. When the neutrino are degenerate, and it doesn't, we don't really care about the fact that the neutrino are massless. What we care about is that the neutrino are degenerate. Because the neutrino are degenerate, we gain the U1 cube. And because we have the U1 cube, there's no flavor change in neutral current kind at all. Right? Because each flavor is completely conserved. Right? So if the masses were uh, degenerate, then the CKM would be diagonal, and there will be no FC, FC and C at one loop and two loop, etc. Yes? Oh, U3? No, no, no. U1 cube, U1 cube just means that each of the flavor is, is by itself. U cube say that all of them can mix together. Okay? More question on FCNC? Now, there's a lot to do, but we'll move on. So, the next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about CP violation and how CP violation is so important when we. Yes? So, <coughs> so again, if the quarks were, were degenerate, let's assume that only one type of them are degenerate, right? Say the up type or the down type. And then it's just like neutrino oscillation, right? And if the neutrino were degenerate, there will be no neutrino oscillation, right? So in order to have neutrino oscillation, you must have that the neutrino are not degenerate, okay? So FC and C and oscillation are very, very much tied together. It's just a matter of uh, time scale. If the oscillation is very, very fast, we call it FCNC. If the oscillation is small, we call it oscillation. Okay. Okay, so let me move to the question of, uh, of CP violation. And as we talked about, naively the story of C, CP, T, CP, all this has nothing to do with flavor, right? There are symmetries that, you know, when do we learn about them first? When we first discuss CP and T, right? It's, I think it's section 3.6 in Peskin, right? Before, he didn't even mention flavor, right? Flavor is somewhere in, don't remember. It has to do with the understanding of the Lorentz group and how the Lorentz group actually acts on fermions and these kind of things. And it apparently has nothing to do with flavor. And indeed, we don't expect anything with CP and CP to do anything with, with flavor. And if you ask questions like what's happened with P or C violation, this is, in a way, has nothing to do with flavor. Right? So you actually can study about p-violation, and you study p-violation, in, for example, in leptons. You can actually, although historically we find p-violation in, <laughs> in some beta decay, we could find p-violation in muon decay. Right? You can do, and there you don't have flavor at all. Flavor is diagonal, everything. P-violation has nothing to do with flavor. It's just the fact that left and right-handed fields have different quantum number under SU2 cross U1. It's completely the gauge structure. Right? It's nothing to do with the fact that we have several, several flavors. Yes? However, CP, it just happened, while it doesn't have to be the case, in nature, CP only happened 
in processes that also violate flavor. Let's say it doesn't ha have to happen, but that's what happened for us. Okay? So now we ask the question, how CP violation? That's why when we talk about CP violation, it's always come in flavor lectures. Okay? Although in principle, in a different world, it would not have. Right? There was one lecture on CP violation and another on flavor. But in our world, it's come together. Because it's, CP violation appears only in something that violates the uh, P. Sorry? Oh, philosophically, it's weird. <laughs> I, um, actually, we can talk a little more about philosophy. I will talk a little bit more about philosophy. But <laughs> hmm? the next hike, next hike, yeah, yeah. Next hike, we should talk about philosophy. So my son took a philosophy class, and... And then he said, there was a big philosophical question. He came back home and he said, wow, you know, I'm so lucky that I'm a hiker. My son is much, much more a hiker than I am. And he said, they discussed for several lectures the question of the river, you know, the philosophy of the river. Can you say that the river is the same? So if, if the water, can you say it's the same river? Because the water in the river are different now than the water before. You know this philosophical question? No? Never saw the river the same river twice. Ah, uh, yes, there, yeah, 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 you never, because it's a different word. And, 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 you know, so I told my son that I'm not so sure because it's a deep, deep thing in physics that all f electrons are the same, right? <laughs> 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 Fundamentally. But, <laughs> I mean, anyway, we had a long discussion about this. Uh, <laughs> what this has to do with CP evaluation? Nothing. <laughs> oh, no, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was your question, it was your question. Let, let's, let's, uh, that was my philosophical remark. Okay, <clears throat> so now we say that one thing I want to say, we discussed CP violation, but just as a remark, I want to mention that C and P are violated in any standard model because in any standard model, the coupling of the left and the right handed field couple differently to the double and under SU2. So P and C and P are violated in any standard model. CP, however, is violated only in our standard model and in many other standard models, but it doesn't have to be violated in any standard model. So that's what we're going to discuss. What are the conditions that we have CP violation in any standard model? And the answer is, anybody know what is the answer? What is the condition to have CP violation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more precise and I'm going to give you all the conditions, but probably there's one condition that maybe not all of you, but many of you know. At least three generations. That's in the standard model. That's true. But I want, I want something a little more. What CP violation always come with? With a phase, right? CP violation always come with the fact that we have a phase. So CP violation just means that you must have a phase. And I want to give a very hand-waving hand argument of why we need a phase. Okay? And the hand-waving argument is the following. So let's say that I have some Lagrangian. And I write my Lagrangian in the following way. I have some Lagrangian like this. And then I'm going to do something that you never seen before, okay? What you always see when you write this Lagrangian, in the beginning when you are really, really young, the sometimes, not, a, not always, sometimes people write this. You remember this? We don't write it anymore, right? But now I'm going to do something that I never, probably you never seen before. I want to write it. <laughs> you, know, you know how to write it? You write plus the emission conjugate. So you write the emission conjugate explicitly. B left bar. That's the emission conjugate. And now you ask the question, what CP is doing for a fermion bilinear? So what you do, you open Feskin chapter 3.6, and you see what it does. And what it does is actually CP. CP take AL, AL bar B right into B left bar AL. OK? So this Lagrangian under CP. Ah, yeah, 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 I was so close. Ah. I had an error-free game until now. <laughs> I learned also baseball in my years in the US. My first baseball shirt that I bought to my kid was the Colorado Rockies shirt in 1994 when I was here. 
I didn't know what it is even, but then I know everything. Okay. Now we are in seven inning. No, bottom of the seven. I was error free, and then boom, broke the pen. <laughs> right field instead of left field. Okay. So under CP, what's happened? This one become y b left bar a right plus y star <coughs> a left bar b right. And you see the following obvious thing, that if this Lagrangian and this Lagrangian are the same, if y is equal to y star. OK? So if y is real, then the CP, when we apply CP on this Lagrangian, this Lagrangian is staying invariant. That means the CP is a good symmetry. OK? Why I say that this is a hand wave argument? The reason that this is a hand wave argument is that there's always the possibility to do a phase redefinition. OK? So what is the true definition of a Lagrangian that conserves CP is that this does not exist any basis where this Y can be, that all the parameters are real. OK? You can always make some parameters real. But as long as you don't find any basis at one of them, that all the, the parameters are real, then CP is uh, violated. OK. <coughs> so we understand that CP has to do with phases. And now we're going to play a little bit with, uh, with phases and <coughs> This kind of things, OK? So let's move about, about and talk about CP violation in the standard model and why CP is violated in the standard model. What is the condition that CP is violated in the standard model? <coughs> and we already heard, and I guess all of us know, that in order for CP to be violated in the standard model, we need three generation. And the reason is that if you Think about how you parameterize the, the, the full standard model, and in particular, all the flavor parameters. We discussed, we mentioned it last time, and I <coughs> don't really go through the formal proof, but in my notes that I have, I have a write-up about this. And you find that in order the parameters, you must have one complex parameter. And in particular, the way we usually write this one complex parameter is the one phase of the CKM, right? The CKM is parameterized. We, we choose a basis where all the masses are real. Of course, we can choose another basis. But we choose a basis that all the masses are real. And the CKM, which is a unitary matrix, is parameterized by three mixing angles that are real. And one phase that is called the Kobayashi Maskawa phase. And it's this one phase that gives CP violation in the standard model. OK? Good. So now we want to ask the question of, remember <coughs> last time we say that CP violation is somewhat small in nature, and I want to discuss how this smallness appears in the standard model, OK? So <coughs> what we really after is the following. What I try to do now, I want to give you some basis-independent measure of CP violation in the standard model and argue that it is small in some way, OK? So in order to have CP violation in the standard model, what we must have, OK? We must have three generation. So we must have, first, we must have a phase. Second, we must have three generation. Why we must have three generation? Because it's in two generation, you can just rotate the phase away. OK? And actually, the third thing that we must have is that all the quarks are non degenerate. OK? All the quarks from the same charge are not degenerate. I mean, we could have that the S and the C are degenerate, that's not a problem. But the D, S, and B are non degenerate, and the U, C, and T are non degenerate. So we must have non degeneracy. Why we must have a non degeneracy? Because if we had some degeneracy, again, we could rotate away one of the parameters of the standard model. We have an extra symmetry, and since we have an extra symmetry, we have some uh, less parameters. So these are the things. We must have a phase, a three generation, and all of them are non degenerate. Okay? So what we conclude out of, uh, of these things, OK? What we conclude out of all of this is that the CP violation in the standard model must be proportional to all the CKMA elements, right? Because if some of the mixing angle were 0, then effectively we'll have a two-generation model. And it must be proportional to all the mass differences of all the masses. Because if some of them were uh, 0, then we will not have CP violation, OK? 
And then we see why CP violation in the standard model is small. CP violation is in the standard model is small, not because the phase is small. The phase is actually order one. It's more because in order to involve all the three generations, we must involve very small CKM elements. And in order to involve, the, to take if account on the fact that the masses are non-degenerate, we must involve also all the delta m's. And all the, some of the delta m's are very, very small. Like m s squared minus m d squared is a very, very small compared to the weak scale. OK? So we see how in the standard model these are kind of a small numbers. And I want to talk a little bit about um, <coughs> how we actually parameterize it. And I want to introduce a few things. The first things I want to introduce is what we call the Jarskog invariant. Maybe you heard about the Jarskog invariant. She's from Sweden, so it's, we start with J, but you pronounce it with Ja, as far as I know. Anybody here from Sweden? No? Nobody have connection to the Nobel Committee? <laughs> you can speak some Swedish? It sounds good. I can say it correctly, Jarskog. Uh -huh. The Jarskog invariant. And Jarskog, Jarskog, and what she showed is actually that in a basis independent, no matter what, there's some measure of CP violation in the standard model. And this measure of its invariant under any basis rotation. And this, the value, it's called J, J for Jarskog. And in the standard basis, this Jarskog invariant is equal to this, C12, C23, C13 squared, S12, <coughs> S13, S23, sinus, sinus of delta Km. OK? So this is some measure of the CP violation. And now it just seems like, you know, I just make, and with this C of theta 1, 3 result is the angle of the unitarity triangle. So, so far it doesn't look very, very impressive. The point is that this one is invariant under whatever parameterization of the CKM that uh, you want to do. And actually, what it turns out, and that's kind of a, a cool result, is that it's have a very nice, put it down. it's a very nice geometrical interpretation, okay? And the very nice ge geometrical interpretation come under the name of the unitarity triangle. M maybe I should stop and, and say one thing before. One thing before is that you see that this is small, right? And it's small not because delta Km is small. It's small because we have all this sign of the angles. And because the angles are small, that's why we are small. And that's actually taking into account the fact that we actually need the three generations and we need all these mixing angles, OK? So that's where this uh, Jarskog invariant uh, play a game. <coughs> but it's actually related to something else that we call the unitarity triangle. And what are the unitarity triangles? And uh, unitarity triangle, it's a very cool concept. So just make this statement kind of nicer. Since we know that the CKM is unitary, we know that we have unitarity relation that we already use up there. And how many unitarity relations we have when we have a three by three matrix that is equal to zero. So I have six of them, three rows, you know, three combination of rows and three combination of columns. So in particular, I can have something like this. Vix, <coughs> Viy star equal to zero, or the other way around. Vxi, <coughs> Vyi star equal to zero, sum over i. OK? And since this V, we have three complex vectors. You can represent them as a triangle in the complex plane, right? And this triangle in the complex plane is called a unitarity triangle. Why a unitarity triangle? Because a triangle, they come from a unitarity relation, OK? So I have six of those unitarity triangles, and I plot them like this. Why I plot them like this? Because that's how I plot a triangle, OK? Now, what has become really nice is the fact that actually, in the standard model, you can show that all six unitarity triangles has the same area. the same area. And this area is equal to 2j, to well, j over 2. Okay? So the area of all unitarity triangles are equal to this measure of j. So this is in invariant, and all these unitarity triangles are the same. And then you plot, then you actually take this unitarity triangle and you plot them. 
So let's take two unitarity triangles and, and plot them. Let's take the first unitarity triangle is the SD unitarity triangle. So in the SD unitarity triangle, what we have, we are here, here uh, <coughs> v, VUS, VUD star plus VCS, VCD star plus VTS, VTD star equal to zero. How this triangle going to look like? Okay. Remember how the, unitar how the CKM is, looks like? When we have connection between the first and the third generation, it's very, very small. Okay? So in this unitarity triangle, this one is of all the, is kind of large. This one is large, but this one is extremely small. Okay? Because this one connects second, <coughs> second and third generation and first and third generation. So this triangle looks like this. Uh-huh. It looks like a triangle. Well, kind of. <laughs> Let's ignore this kind of thing. And then I want to do another triangle. I want to do the BD unitarity triangle. And in the BD unitarity triangle, what you find out that all the three sides of them are roughly the same order. And this other unitarity triangle looks like this. OK? And can you tell that the area is the same? Hmm? Yes? Can you tell? You cannot tell? <laughs> you die. <laughs> I counted on you and you say you cannot tell. OK, let me explain. So here the height is small, but the base is large. And here both the height and the are small <laughs> and the other thing. OK? The point to make is as following, OK? <coughs> All of those unitarity triangles have the same area, but some of them are very, very squished, squished like this. And some of them are, look more like a, a regular triangle that you see on every day. Right? And when we talk about unitarity triangle, this unitarity triangle have a special name. It's called D unitarity triangle. Why? Because it looks like a triangle and the rest, you know, it's unlikely triangles. Why do we care much more about this one? Because when we try to measure phases, it's much easier to measure phases of this kind of a triangle than this kind of a triangle. Is it right? Because you have experimental error. When you have experimental error, it's very, very hard to measure, to construct such triangles. But such triangle, it's kind of easier. But of course, in order to generate this kind of triangle, you have to measure three small numbers. Here, you have to measure two very, very large numbers and one very tiny number to a very, very high, high accuracy. OK, so we learn about the <coughs> unitarity triangle. Um, I guess I need two more minutes to finish the standard model. Can I go two more minutes? Yes? I <coughs> just have this one, one last thing I want to say. Sorry? Oh, it depends which one of them and depends how you do this. But the, the bounds are of order 1%. Okay? So, and depend on which, you know, so it's clearly different if you took look on this and this. But there's, we know quite well that they are look close to a triangle. Yes? No. No, absolutely no. And I really confuse, and that has to do very much with the way we choose what we call the standard parameterization. And if you like, is you know, when we learn the Euler angles, you remember? And one angle was different than the other two, right? It's somehow related to this. It's not exactly the same. When you think about an Euler, you have three rotations. They are not all of them the same. And I, I don't have a better, but I definitely spend time thinking. And why it's only in the cosine and not in the sine? I don't know. But but then I just said, you know, there's just one parameterization. Who cares? That's what I care about. All the areas are the same. Pa, 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 that space is independent. Probably I should not even mention it, right? I should just say there's something called J, and it's related to the, this area of this unitarity triangle. And then it's nice, right? So let me just mention the last thing is the following. So we know that the C CP violation has to be also proportional to the masses. So at the end of the day, CP violation must be proportional to the following thing, OK? And uh, there's one little thing that I don't know about why it's the <coughs> squared, but it must be proportional to the following thing, to the product of all the delta m squared, delta m squared ij in the up sector squared, time delta m squared ij in the down sector, 
time j. Okay? So we, what I'm saying is that it must be proportional to all those factors because j gives me the size of the CKM that has to do with the fact that I need a phase and I need three generation. And this product of delta m's take care of the fact that if two of the masses were, ze I were degenerate, then I would get zero. So therefore, it must be proportional to the difference and the same argument that I gave you up here that is end up to be squared, and I don't know why you have to do the calculation, you get that it's squared, okay? But it doesn't matter really. All I'm care is that it's much difference to time delta m, okay? And that's really, really why this is a very, very small number in whatever unit. So if, yes? If two, two masses are degenerate, you get uh, one of the signs to be zero, so that you, so you get the J already zero? <coughs> So I'm confused now. So I, you know, I know, I know, I know. I, I, under, I exactly understand the question. I say I'm, I'm confused, and it's already I'm going over time. So I, I, I will try to. I, I have to think about it. I don't, I don't have an answer. The last thing I want to say is the following. So this is what we know. This is kind of the small overall thing. But at the end of the day, we can still get a large CP violation, right? We can measure CP violation, sinus 2 beta, you know, some asymmetries of order 1. So this is the CP violation that we have in the standard model. And it's small, but some of this smallness we can take care of if we actually use small branching ratios. So if, say, we use some small branching ratios, it's not the CP violation that we have. The total is small. So what we really care about that the total number of events that we need in order to establish CP violation somehow have to be proportional to this kind of a product, okay? But it doesn't have to come only in the CP violation that we measure. It has to come in everything that we put together, okay? So I, the, the, the explanation is as following. If you ask, when you uh, ask if I have the full standard model, then that's the measure of CP violation. But if I have one specific experiment, let's say I look for K long decay, then I only care about k long, then I already projected out the k on. And by projecting out the k on, I kind of say, well, I, I only pay the price because I don't pick up a charm and I don't pick up a bottom. I pick up a k on, so I already reduced my statistic by picking up only k ons, so I don't need these factors of the delta m's that stand in front. Okay? Yes? So, why I was asking is that, like, uh, now we have this uh, cinema model source of. Violation. Yes. So is there other, other kind of mechanism to violate CP? Because it's related to T violation. There's many, many ways to violate CP, not in the standard model. The way to violate CP is as following. You must have a phase that is, you cannot remove this phase. That in any basis there exists a phase, then it's CP violation. And of course, this Yaskog invariant, you can go to other models and you can find that in other models you have 10 or 20 or 30. Okay, so, you know, some, whatever, pick your favorite Susie model, and you can have 10 Yarskogs, or 20 Yarskogs, or 5 Yarskogs, or 3 Yarskogs, and each of them, and it has, and in general, they have nothing to do with flavor. But is there, yeah, is there a reason why those are suppressed? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I want to emphasize, okay? So let me kind of conclude, and we can talk about it later, because I really ran out of time. So I wanted to, that's my first two lectures, I wanted to discuss only the standard model, and... Uh, tomorrow, and that is tomorrow, I'm not making a mistake now, we're going to go beyond the standard model. And I, let me just emphasize the big picture that we say about the standard model. In the standard model, flavor is special because it's only the W plus that mediate it, okay? It's only there that we have CP violation, and there exist many, many small parameters. And it's this combination of the fact that we have only CP violation there, only charge current can violate flavor, and we end up to have very small numbers. That's why it makes it so interesting. That's why, actually, it's so hard to go beyond the standard model. So that's what I will start doing tomorrow. I go beyond the standard model. Thanks.